It's the same kind of problem that the banks are having right now where the assets they have, they didn't hedge their interest rate risk. They thought rates would stay low forever. And now if they have to meet the dep uh, depositors' redemptions, they said, give us back our money. Well, with nothing in the way of reserves, their only option is to sell those assets that were not hedged at a massive loss. Bang, you're out of business. Whatever it is, whoever is doing it, the, the act of resetting the system will be one that will be a religious experience for most people. It will be something that most people are not prepared for. Hey, and good afternoon, everyone. I have the leader of the de-dollarization understanding on the planet right here with me right now. I know a lot of you have asked me questions about this, and I feel I need to reach out to somebody who knows more than myself. Andy Schechtman here, CEO of Miles Franklin. You know, hearing about the de-dollarization campaign and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Shanghai Gold Exchange and how all that is the cornerstone of will be a, a new trading mechanism that is going to usurp the dollar slowly, but eventually, surely. And then suddenly we start to see, you know, the disturbance in the Middle East. And I thought, oh, you know what? They're making you look left over at the Gaza-Israel thing. But behind that, I think that it has something to do with the Iranian delivery of oil to China to disrupt that, because then that would force Russia to then split deliveries to India and then also China. And imagine the discombobulation in uh just flat off stopping of industries without enough oil to go through the areas. So that's why I wanted to get him on today. And uh, we're just going to throw some ideas back and forth. And it's all organic. We didn't pair anything except for our own knowledge of, you know, what we see possibilities of disruption to slow down or limit the evolution of this uh, new BRICS Align trading block. So Andy, I appreciate you joining me. Thank you. David, it's good to be here, brother. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for the kind words and the introduction. And yeah, um, these are very interesting times, as the Chinese curse says. May you live in interesting times. They are. They're very fluid. They're changing by the day. So yeah, let's get into it and see if we can make heads and tails of what's going on. Okay, so the first thing I would throw is uh, we've seen the Declaration of Yemen now jumping in on the opposite side. And Oman also has recently stated that there is a no-fly zone over for, they originally started with Israeli aircraft, but now it's just all Western nations are not allowed to transit through their airspace corridor. Now think about that, that's two pincers. You got the, the pincer with Yemen over in the Red Sea, that would be the inlet or outlet of the Suez Canal. And now we got a pincer, at least on one side of a nation saying, oh, your oil might not be going through the Straits of Hormuz. So where does that leave us? You know, you talked about mining, farming, supply chains, and and then I'm going to say eventually rationing. So what kind of, you know, instant uh, effects would that have if the oil stops or gets curtailed across the planet then? Well, I mean, yeah, it's very much like a massive oil embargo, only a whole lot different when you're talking shutting off 20% of the world's oil supply that goes through the Straits of Hormuz. It's no joke. And, and when you look at the countries that comprise or who have just signed on to BRICS, you got the countries that control this region, Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt. Um, so these are our distinct possibilities, no question about it. I look at it a little bit differently. Uh, rather than it um, affecting China with a splintering, I mean, look, you got Russia as a second largest oil exporter in the world, I think, selling uh, Russian oil to, to China at a discount in, in Yuan uh, is something that has been going on and will continue to go on. I think Saudi Arabia selling oil to China for Yuan, which, by the way, is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, um, has been going on for a while. Venezuela just applied to uh, the BRICS nations, and they're supposedly supposedly have the largest oil reserve in the world, untapped oil reserve. And so Canada hopes to boost regulation on natural health products, otherwise known as supplements. This stretches across the border from Canada and the United States, both. And have you heard about nictotinamide mononucleotide, NMN? It's a derivative of vitamin B niacin, a precursor to NAD+, a compound 
for muscle regeneration, metabolism, and energy production in your body. And as we navigate into this grand solar minimum, food shortages, economic shifts, and our health are paramount. And this represents a tool in the Adaptation Toolkit, offering benefits like energy enhancement and anti-aging. But the FDA's potential reclassification threatens this access. We're all going to have to navigate the future with the changes. Give Black Forest and MN a try. Remember, prepping out, two is one and one is none. Lucky, buy two, get one completely free, which makes it three. Click on that link in the description box below. And now on with the video. I think I understand what you're saying, and there will be unintended consequences as it pertains to uh, the Chinese economy, as it pertains to aspirations, perhaps. But I think this will have a much more profound effect on the United States, because more than anything, along with that shutting off of supply, how about they just shut down accepting dollars for oil? Because after all, it was the protection of the Saudi kingdom in 1974 that basically said, we'll protect you. You denominate oil in dollars and take the proceeds and buy U.S. Treasuries. Well, the U.S. Treasury market will go down as the worst bear market in the last two years in the history of the bond market. The dollar is being inflated away. And we've told Saudi Arabia that we're going green. In fact, we signed an executive order attesting to that. It has been my contention in over 1,200 videos that I've done in over three years that that's exactly what will happen. The day we left Saudi, or the day we left Afghanistan with our tail between our legs, with people hanging from a transport plane with 3,000 American people behind enemy lines, and worse, almost as bad or worse, the, the, the freedom fighters and, and the um, interpreters who we left behind is as gross as anything this country's ever done internationally. And there's no coincidence that the day after that, Russia announced a joint military cooperation agreement with Saudi Arabia. It has been our protection of them for almost 50 years that has given us the dollar hegemony. And when you throw into the mix the weaponizing of the dollar and, and confiscating Russia's forex reserves on top of signing executive order to go green, on top of a bond market disaster and an inflated dollar, I think the likelihood of this conflict more than anything exacerbates the chance that they just say, look, thanks for the memories. We, us being Saudi Arabia, have joined the BRICS. We have, along with all of our OPEC brothers and sisters, all of us are on the Belt Road, which is 75% of human population as we speak, 50% of the global GDP. We've joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or applied to it. Iran is a full member the largest regional financial and military organization in the world. We're in essence being protected by two of the three largest nuclear arsenals on the planet. We've joined the BRICS New Development Bank and we told the World Bank in Davos that we are open to taking other currencies for oil. What the hell do they want to be tied to a country that is inflating away their, mark, uh, their dollar, destroying the bond market, not on the same side of their politically or ideo ideologically, um, and, and going green and signing an executive order attesting to it. So if, if anything, I think this actually has a much more profound, potentially disastrous effect on the United States. If every country on the planet who stockpiled dollars for 50 years to, to accumulate oil, all of a sudden has an alternative and dumps those dollars, the hyperinflationary effect of that would create a tsunami of dollars that you could see from space moving across the ocean, hitting our shores. And the byproduct of that is something that the Fed has definitely no intention of doing themselves, and that is spiking interest rates to the moon. The byproduct of that, to compensate for that inflation, are stocks, bonds, and real estate collapsing. That's the great reset moment that Klaus Schwab talks about, or Thomas Jefferson 300 years ago, who said, if you give a central bank the ability to control the money supply, First, by inflation. Now, we saw that inflation. Over the last four years, more money was created than in the history of the U.S. before it. Add into it the suppression of interest rates where the federal funds rate was at zero for the better part of a decade. That inflationary tsunami created massive distortions in, in valuations. He goes on to say, then by deflation, you'll end up renting the land back from 
that, that our forefathers conquered. Something like that, very similar to what Klaus Schwab said, but look at the deflationary effects right now. Look at the repo market being drained, which is the lifeblood of, of, of liquidity for, for the market, for corporations. It's all chasing yield at the treasury, buying treasuries. It's siphoning money out of the banking system and now out of the repo market. It is seeing a, a fall off in, in M2 like we've never seen before, which is going to create a wicked recession, if not much worse. You put all of this together, to me, what is happening, yes, it will have an effect on, on Chinese GDP and, and their export numbers. But when you talk about 80 to 85% of human population being in the BRICS, the SCO, the Eurasian Economic Union and the Belt Road Initiative, um, I think it's it's you could argue that we will end up on the wrong side of this trade, potentially. And I hope I'm wrong because I got three young kids and, and I, I want to be wrong, but I I don't think I, I am. I'd love to hear your 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 pushback on that and I'm um, happy to address any questions. Well, I find it kind of interesting that just less than two weeks ago, the United States lifted sanctions off of Venezuela for oil exports and also gold at the same time. Like, wow, they had a magical crystal ball to do that. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, I'm wondering uh, how the derivatives market would be hit if the oil did go from present $80, let's say, and it went up to 200 for example. Like, How would that come winding back as sort of a trump card move into the unwinding of derivatives market that's mainly based out of these Western nations? Well, I, I, you know, in terms of the derivative markets and oil, look, they had the ability somehow to make it negative 40 a barrel uh, a, a couple of years ago. I remember the that. derivatives market is the root of many of the problems in our financial markets, whether it be in commodities, where right now silver is 1,700% rehypothecated in the registered category. Those are the bars that back the contracts. There's 1,700% more contracts written on silver than there are uh, bars able to be delivered. And, I, and when you talk about any of these derivative markets, it's become a casino where the tail wags the dog, where the bets are being made uh, that are not directly related to offsetting risk. Uh, as an example, um, what is the COMEX designed for? The COMEX is designed to offset risk. If I own 2,000 ounces of gold in our warehouse, I will sell 2,000 ounces on paper because if not, let's say the price, which earlier uh, last month fell by 200 bucks an ounce over a month long period, that would put me down $400,000. But what I sold short, the exact same amount would be up 400000 It allows me to be market neutral in the metal value, not the premium, but the metal value. So when you're trying to hedge as a producer your risk uh, uh, or as, as some sort of, of a, um, uh, uh, um, an industrial that needs to hedge the risk of the oil market, you're doing it in a covered fashion, right? I'm shorting what I have in physical, so I am not subject to tantamount risk. But if you're a hedge fund who thinks you're smart and you're on the wrong side of a trade like that, that goes parabolic, it will bankrupt banks, it will bankrupt hedge funds, it will bankrupt corporations that are on the wrong side of a naked short. So I think the distortions and the leverage that is created in the Western markets it will be the undoing of many of the Western markets when it unwinds, most of which have been valued basis a, uh, a very unnatural phenomenon of wickedly suppressed interest rates for over a decade, which has created anomalies in everything from oil to metals to, to real estate to, to anything. And I think the unwinding of this will have perilous effects in both directions, potentially. Yeah, so boil it down to the basic then. So if it comes down to oil spiking at that price, derivative market will no longer exist. So the actual physical will only be the physical available for everybody. And then you'll have these behemoths of what we know as superpower nations. And again, with that much firepower over in a lot of raw producers along the BRICS aligned nations, then how does that disturb supply chains coming in or out for us? If we only have physical and that is truly it there's no more derivatives market you can't even hedge risk any longer because it is completely broken down and what you get is a physical thing and i don't care if it's zinc or tin or fish or cocoa or rubber or whatever it is 
Like, how does yeah. that leave us? I've been doing a lot of study in World War II on the rationing. The first thing was hit was rubber. That was a massively rationed good because it was coming from Indochina and the sh shipping lanes were non-functional at that point. Well, if you look at zinc as an example, 90% uh, of the zinc was delivered off the LBMA, the London Metals Exchange, last year. 75% of their aluminum. It's not just gold and silver, but how would it affect the commodity market? Well, I'll tell you how it would affect the commodity market, at least in terms of a metals company. We have, I don't know, 70 plus million dollars of inventory and it's all hedged. I couldn't hold 70 million in inventory if I couldn't hedge it, meaning offset my risk in a volatile market. If you can't hedge it, then it's cash and carry. And that's why I believe the ultimate undoing of the COMEX and the LBMA will be its leverage, the fact that it is rehypothecated. It's the same environment today that the Hunt brothers witnessed in 1980. Hey, there's way more paper than there are bars. Let's buy all the paper and and demand delivery and there aren't enough bars there the price will go to the moon well they changed the rules on the hunt brothers making you can only be long a certain amount but you can be short whatever you want well all those contracts had to be sold or it was a violation of law they go to jail so when you talk about a disruption in the um the futures market no one will be able to hold an inventory of anything that they can't hedge i don't care if it's sugar or cocoa or tin or aluminum or metals, that is the whole premise of uh, a futures market where you are offsetting risk, whether it be planting a field for a farmer in April and, and selling the production to a farmer or to a baker who needs that wheat in September, they agree to a price that now neither of them have risk. I mean, well, they do. I mean, the farmer may have a horrible year and, and the baker may have paid too much or vice versa. But the point of it is it's designed to offset risk. It's turned into a casino. And if you can't offset risk as, as a company like a metals company or, or, a, or a massive oil and gas refiner, and they pay for all of that oil and can't hedge their risk, well, that's a problem. So that's why I believe ultimately you will see when the West can no longer deliver on their make-believe prices, you will see either Abu Dhabi uh, or, or the Shanghai Gold Exchange these exchanges or the Russian metals exchange, these exchanges, which will be largely cash and carry, will take over. Now, they're the, con the countries that produce it all, accumulate it all. You talk about, you know, Indochina, Indonesia and the Chinese con or the, the Asian continent is where all the rare earth metals are, the majority of them. President Ndudu from Indonesia says we need to have a rare earth metal style cartel, like an OPEC coat cartel for rare earth metals. All of these things they produce, they accumulate, and I would argue they've been producing and accumulating a whole hell of a lot more than they tell uh, the reporting agencies or, or official government figures. And the majority of all the metal that is being uh, purchased off of the Western exchanges, uh, I believe, is going eastward. And there's an old saying, he or she who has the gold makes the rules, and that hasn't changed. So I think it will disrupt greatly the, the entire commodity uh, infrastructure and it, there has to be something or or everything is is you pay you get when it's delivered you cannot hold a large inventory of commodities that change in price whether it be raw materials that go to your finished product or a finished product that you want to have a, a large inventory of you want to go out of business hold a couple thousand ounces of gold and a hundred, couple hundred thousand ounces of silver and don't hedge it in this volatile world and see what happens. Yeah, you may win some when it goes up, but when it goes down, now what? If it went down 200 bucks an ounce, how are you going to sell your gold eagles that you haven't hedged when you're only making, if you're lucky, 2% on it? So if you make 30, 40 bucks, but you're out 200, you're going to go bankrupt. It's the same kind of problem that the banks are having right now where the assets they have they didn't hedge their interest rate risk. They thought rates would stay low forever. And now if they have to meet the dep uh, depositors redemptions, they said, give us back our money. Well, with nothing in the way of reserves, their only option is to sell those assets that were not hedged at a massive loss. Bang, you're out of business. Silicon Valley, 36 hours. That's what happened. So you don't have an orderly futures market. There is nothing in the way of metals markets. Oil goes to the moon. All of these things get massively disrupted, and as does our economy. You're talking a Great Depression type of environment in terms of finished goods and whatnot. Well, Andy, the, those banks are too big to fail. You know they're never going to fail. Come on. So I had a question for you. Wind back the clock. 
if we're going to reverse back to a cash and carry world for a minute, I'm just saying for a minute, at, if there were such a breakdown to occur, obviously things would reform and it would be pretty fast on the reformation, obviously in a different part of the world. And those that uh, had lost the control will be left in the in the quagmire that they are. But in terms of history itself, walking us through the economic evolution of all of these things, hedging, how far back in time do we need to go to a, a cash and carry world? And how long do you think that would exist before uh, something evolved out of that to bring us back into, again, being able to really start moving supply chains around without much risk again? So maybe I guess a couple part question. Well, it's an interesting question. And I think I'm going to be right on this in terms of my time. But so right here, President Roosevelt, there's an executive order. He confiscated gold in 1933. Gold was currency back then. Everybody owned it. Everyone. Everyone had gold in their pocket, basically, because it was it was the currency of the realm. There were their $20 coins, 10, 5, 3, a two and a half, and one dollar gold coins. Everyone had them. He confiscated it. And it was illegal to own until I want to say 1974, uh, President Ford made it legal again, I believe, and, and in the United States. Within a day or two, maybe the next day of him making it legal, they created the futures market. Um, and so it, you're talking it wasn't legal to own it before the futures market came into, uh, into focus. And, you know, precious metals companies... Uh, I guess you could say really started gaining steam in the late seventies, early eighties, as the price of gold went after we closed the gold window in 71 from 35 to 850. And so, you know, everything that this industry knows has been a function of the derivatives market. I mean, they, it's just what it is. Uh, but I think you can take a look at something more like the Shanghai gold exchange which has delivered somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 times more gold in the last few years than the COMEX market has. They're a cash and carry market predominantly. They do have a Shanghai futures exchange, but predominantly it's a cash and carry market where the price is more reflective of reality. Interestingly enough, they have been slowly, and I don't care what the explanations are, economic explanations, I don't buy it. I believe they're doing this for a reason. The Chinese have slowly been raising the price of gold. And last I looked in Shanghai, it's $100 an ounce, nearly more in Shanghai than it is off the LBMA or the COMEX. Keep raising it little by little and arbitrage all of that, all of the world's metals. They're buying all of the world's commodities. There was a report by JP Morgan the other day, they hold the lion's share of the aluminum, of the copper, of the wheat, of the soybeans. I mean, they're buying everything that you would need. And Zoltan Pozar, who worked at the New York Fed, understands the plumbing of the financial system better than anyone. I think he's at UBS now, but he said, we've now transitioned to Bretton Woods three. So just a brief history lesson, Bretton Woods one was when the allies after World War II took over for the pound sterling, where gold, the dollar was pegged to gold at 35 bucks an ounce, where, where the only tier one asset was US dollars and treasuries. Bretton Woods two loosely, would be when Nixon closed the gold window in 71 and the deal we struck with the Saudis in 73 will protect you. You'll, you'll value oil always globally in dollars. And since that day, over 85% of all the world's oil sales are in dollars. This is a synthetic demand for the petrodollar. That's Bretton Woods too. He says we've now entered Bretton Woods three, which is a system that will be denom or dominated by transparency and mostly by commodities. And so you look at the LBMA losing most of its zinc and its aluminum and its silver and its gold and its copper. You look at the deliveries off of the world's exchanges. These countries are using the suppression of the Western market. They're not bitching because they're accumulating it all. And at subsidized prices, See, the West didn't really take this into account when they started this game. Most of these nations were too poor and too under-industrialized to say, oh, thanks, for lowering the price. We'll stand for delivery. Thank you very much. And now you have this situation where a lot of these sovereign wealth funds, uh, which, which are a third classification of traders on the commitment of traders report that the COMEX publishes every week. For years, they would show two groups, the commercial banks on one side and the hedge funds they call the specs on the other. 
And as one would go long, the other would go short. And they, that still happens. But out of nowhere in 2020, a third group appeared out of nowhere on this report. The Commitment of Traders report is something that Comex publishes every week. And I don't put too much stock in it because it's probably bullshit anyway. But the, the third group of traders are called the others. And they're believed to be sovereign wealth funds mostly. Family offices too. Most of them trade on the super private Globex market that connects to the Comex. And they have been draining the exchanges, whether it be through outright deliveries of commodities off the COMEX or exchange for physical, where they buy the contract here and send it and take delivery in London, or delivery off the LBMA, or delivery off the Shanghai Gold Exchange, or delivery out of the ETFs. They are using the suppression of the Western paper price, which has been done to support this illusion of, of dollar strength of a strong bond market to drain the shelves. Uh, and I think this is a trend that is growing and it will be a very big problem in the end when the rest of the world who will value commodities at their fair price, cash and carry, instead of the tail wagging the dog where the futures price controls the market price, it should be the commodity price controls the future price. It's backwards right now. Once they've siphoned from as many people who are stupid enough to let go of what they have, then they'll flip the switch like that and say, you know what, here's the real price of gold and it's 500 bucks higher than the COMEX and the LBMA has and anyone that wants to sell it to us, we're willing buyers. And silver, it's now 75 bucks an ounce. Who wants to sell it to us? Now, again, I just throwing numbers. Who knows what it is? But I think that is what will happen. And very quickly, this fractionalized, uh, leveraged um, system much like our currency system, this, this fractionalized leverage system will very quickly be exposed for what it is. And that is uh, something that has not done anyone who holds silver or gold or oil or produces it, any of these producers, any of these corporates, hasn't done anyone any favors. And all it's done is create a, a very big problem that I think we're going to find a lot of companies will have a very hard time extricating themselves from these ridiculously large short positions. Like you said, they won't let a bank fail, right? If I were going to pick one bank, one commercial bank that they sacrifice at the altar, maybe it's Bank of America. They have 1 billion ounces short of silver in the OTC market. 1 billion, almost all of it naked short. Now, who the hell would be dumb enough to short a billion ounces of silver? And the bigger question is why? Why are they shorting gold and silver? That don't, they're, they're shorting probably dollar-wise more gold than they are silver. Why? What is the reason behind it? And that's the thing that, you know, very quickly, when you look at these the, the top four commercial banks, uh, Bank of America being one of them, they have $150 trillion in derivatives. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. One of these blow up and it drags down the whole system with it. So if I were going to sacrifice one, it would be Bank of America. And, but who knows? The banking system in general has $7 trillion in uninsured deposits. And all of this, I say all of this stuff because we talk about a reset. Look, if you look at the top two economic advisors to the United States government, David, number one is Jared Bernstein. He's, he's a guy who has a degree in music and a master's degree in social work. He's the lead economic advisor to our country. His whole thesis is losing the world reserve status. He's publicly written about this, picked up in the New York Times, dethroned King Dollar, when Trump uh, slapped sanctions on China, he said, good, hopefully we lose our world reserve stats, picked up in the Washington Post. He is a lead economic advisor. Do you think there's a coincidence? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, that we weaponize the dollar, making everyone in the world think, hmm, are we next? And then we, we, we tell Saudi Arabia we're going green, which is the linchpin to the hegemony. And you look at the way the world views us. You know, we, we invaded Iraq 20 years ago. Uh, we supposedly liberated their country. We destroyed it under the guise of weapons of mass destruction. Oh, sorry, didn't find any. We've been holding all of their oil revenue for 20 years. They're not allowed to do anything with it. In 2022, they made $90 billion in oil revenue. They asked us for a billion dollars last month. We said no. So what do they do? They say, kiss my ass. And they are making trading in dollars. If you have a company illegal, you'll, go, you'll be put in jail and they'll take your company. And as of January 1, 2024, the physical dollar bill, hundreds and whatnot, are gone. All the banks will have, they'll be gone. They're pushing back. We are looked at as completely hypocritical. And so the reason I think these things is, look at what he's doing. Weaponize the dollar, coerce everyone into doing what you need to do. Tell the linchpin of the hegemony we're going green. 
Well, that sounds like a really good pathway into losing the world reserve status. And now you have a villain to point to. It was those bastards, Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC. How could they do it to us after 50 years? How could they do this to us? And the people in this country, largely, not people watching you, but most of the people in your neighborhood and in my neighborhood and around us will believe it was them who did it to us. We're a victim. They're the villain. And it resets the whole system when every country on the planet dumps dollars because they've had to stockpile them, creating that demand. That massive mountain tsunami of inflation has to be compensated by interest rates that spike commensurate with it, or you might as well just burn your dollars. You can't have 5% interest rates with 30% inflation. So interest rates go to the moon. Powell's not to blame for it. It was them who did it. Everything resets, but have no fear because Lael Brainerd is here. Who's Lael Brainerd? The number two economic advisor of the US government, a modern monetary theorist. She ran point for FedNow. Most people don't know what FedNow is. It came out two months ago. Fed now is Venmo and Zell backed by the Federal Reserve. It will take the place of checks and wires within a year or less. It's instant settlement backed by the Fed. When she was working at the Boston Fed, she worked uh, in conjunction with MIT in development of the new central bank digital currency, which Biden wrote into executive order by mandate of the Bank of International Settlements, which demanded that every country in the world have an operational CBDC by 2025. Now, how do you get people to take that CBDC? You create an event. The dollar collapses, interest rates spike, the banks collapse, stocks collapse, real estate collapses, everything collapses. And it was those bastards who ruined it for us. Have no fear. Take the CBDC, sign on the dotted line. I know you didn't want to before, but you have to. Now we'll make you whole. That's what modern monetary theory says. Her whole premise is to destroy the banking system and issue a central bank digital currency controlled by the Fed so they can control monetary and fiscal policy right to your iPhone. And when you see the decisions that are being made, like allowing the reverse repo market to house them, the money market funds, which is siphoning all the money out of the regional banks, and then lifting the treasury rate above that 5.3% reverse repo market fund rate, and all that money is leaving the repo market going to the treasury, treasurydirect.gov, buying six-month treasuries. The point of it is we are this close to the whole thing breaking apart, and it breaks apart if Saudi Arabia and OPEC say we're done taking dollars for oil. We don't align politically or ideologically. Uh, you're going green anyway. We've joined the BRICS, the Belt Road, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I mean, you just look at it, and is it coincidental? I don't know. You tell me. But I believe a country that is 160 trillion in debt, 33 trillion, yeah, we all know about that. How about Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and government military pensions? 130 trillion unfunded with 5 trillion in assets, of which 40% or 1.6 trillion is student debt, the largest asset of the United States government. We are at 130% debt to GDP. And David, there has never, not once in history, been a country that crossed that number and come back without defaulting outright or hyperinflating away their currency, which is default. So my assertion to all of this is that what's happening in the Middle East is only going to exacerbate the final outcome of the dollar being dumped as the sole settlement currency for oil. This is what the government wants. It allows a country that has mismanaged the world reserve currency to the most ridiculous level ever to not fall on a sword and be blamed for it. Instead, it will be the BRICS and Putin and Xi Jinping and OPEC. And now it enables an event large enough where everyone is leveled to the same level, where everyone loses everything. The wealthiest people are hit the hardest. Lose it all, Klaus Schwab says, you'll be happy to rent because you got your ass handed to you. And now you take a CBDC that most people listening to your show would say, I ain't never taken that thing. But what happens when you lose everything? Are you a little bit more apt to take it? Or are you going to hold out on your on your ideal, ideological um, uh, beliefs? So that's my two cents. And but I love to hear what you have to say because look, I'm not married to any one thing, and this has been something that has grown over time with me. Um, I started down this road because gold was reclassified the only other tier one asset. Caught my eye. Why the hell are they doing that after 75 years? And why are the central banks repatriating it? Why are they buying it? And that led me to the Belt Road, to the BRICS, and to this agenda. So um, please, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or, or um, comments that you have. 
Yeah, and one thing I've noticed too, uh, the way they're they're getting people to switch unbeknownst into the FedNow accounts is the new terms of service for your banks. If you look into it, they're moving you over to the Pays wallet. They even call it a wallet. So you either adhere to the new terms of service or you lose access to your debit cards. So how can they guarantee a vendor payment, even though you may or may not have the money in there, but see, it's it's a FedNow account that's already linked to your, what you consider traditional bank account. If you have had a notice this year to sign up for new terms of service and you see that word pays wallet in there, you've already been flipped in. At least the money you're depositing now into that is now under the Fed now. Uh, and you have a specific account wallet number, just like you would if you have a any uh, private Bitcoin address or anything else, it's inside. It's your own individual FedNow wallet tagged to your social security number. And that's the way they're doing it right now because a lot of people don't know if I just update and accept the terms of service, I've opted into that system. Now, every dollar you put in from this point, like from your paycheck goes into that FedNow account and the old dollars that you had are gonna be obviously switched over as well. You can pull yeah. it out and how often would it, or will it be the access to ATMs, et cetera. But you brought up a really important point, how everything is inverted right now with the uh, with the assets and the prices in, in the markets. Well, the same thing with food is true. The value of silver used to be the grains of wheat that were equivalent to the silver. It wasn't the way you use that silver to buy. It was the opposite. Uh, 248 grains, I believe, was for the silver price when, and when you change it out. So when you're talking hyperinflation, you know, how are people going to eat? How are people going to get through to put food in their bellies because my whole thing is it seems like we're coming into at least a minimum 400 year low in solar activity that was going to disrupt food production anyway across the planet hungry people do strange things and now we see all these excuses just set up like dominoes to explain away supply chain shortages there wasn't enough fertilizer uh the farm tractors there's a diesel rationing of uh, prices are going to increase it's almost as it's being set up to explain away you know, the thing that really makes a civilization is food. No food, no civilization, because if people aren't eating, they're not productive in any way, shape or form. So the question would be, who with the triple front war starting, we got Russia going on, we got the Middle East and China obviously is going to get into the mix eventually. So who's benefiting? Like who gets the benefit from a triple fronted war on the terms of assets and food production is probably a best question to ask. The military industrial complex gets very rich. Bill Gates owns the majority of the farmland in the United States. I mean, it's very sick when you think about it, that these people are able to play these kinds of games with humanity, think that they can play like God and the consequences or the unintended consequences will be ridiculous. A lot of people will, will have no choice but to suck off the government tit. I mean, that's what it will be. That's what they want. Uh, they would rather say, you know, what you, you don't want prosperity, you want protection. You want to, you know, everything should be redistributed. Uh, you should rely on the, the government. Uh, I don't know. I mean, is it any coincidence that it seemed like every egg uh, and chicken product uh, producer in, in America started on fire last year or the year before? I mean, is that coincidental? I don't know. And it's a it's a very valid question and it's a very good question. And, and I think that that's why a productive farm is as good of an asset as you can own. Uh, no question about it. But these are real questions that people need to ask themselves that, you know, most people won't even think of, won't be able to get out of the way what's coming because they wouldn't even acknowledge that that to be a true statement. But it is. It is very true. And, uh, you know, you think supply chains are bad right now. Look, all of those, you talk about oil, everything we touch from surfing the internet to mining to farming, it all is a, a, a function of the cost of, of oil. People say, well, we produce more oil than anyone in the world. Fair. We produce 18, we have the capability, I guess, of producing like 18% of the world's oil, but we use 20%. So yeah, I mean, we could become far more self-sufficient. And quite frankly, you know, if you look at a reset, look, the best thing in my mind that could happen out of all of this is is we we rein things in. Um, we we protect our border. we 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 bring home manufacturing. we 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 incentivize energy production. We incentivize farming. We do all of these things. That's hope. One of the things that I'm very concerned about is that if you look throughout all of history and the u s. has always done well when its back was against the wall, but we were united. We believed in 
in in the nuclear family. We believed largely in 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 God. We we respected authority. We didn't have lawlessness. You know that was the least of our concerns in in the major cities. Um, and and now we are divided, black and white and red and blue and and vaccine, no vaccine and rich and poor and. You're defined by who you voted for. You can't even have a conversation with your brother-in-law at Thanksgiving dinner without it coming to blows. And that's not the way it used to be. You respected one another. I come from a time where you respected everybody. You didn't celebrate them, but you respected them. I don't care what drugs you do or who you sleep with. But now it's front and center on everything. And I just think that's very bad when you talk about a situation like that, where potentially People are hungry um, and the economy is in shambles and people have lost more than they have or they've lost everything. The fact that we're not united and we're at each other's throats is the scariest part of all. This used to be a country where we were all Americans. We weren't black or white. We all came from somewhere. Our, our, Our family came from somewhere else. We were all Americans and now we're anything but. We're a divided country. Divide and conquer. That's the first step of the communist manifesto. I mean, and that's the road we are heading down. And so there are no easy answers to these questions. But everything you do reluctantly to prepare, worst case scenario, you got a bunch of food and water and guns and ammunition and precious metals and small bills and cash and batteries and whatever the hell you need to make it for a while. And you build a community and you get people uh, to have conversations about what's happening realistically and try your best to build that community of like-minded people because when it if it does go bad and supply chains are broken you'll find out real quick what it is to go hungry living in the inner city living in a in a in a you know even in the suburbs when all the grocery store I live I, I've lived in Minnesota my whole life and two years ago I moved to Florida and I I've I've seen what happens when a hurricane is coming you know, go to Publix grocery store, grocery store, there's 2,000 of them. They're on every street corner in Florida, and there ain't a damn thing in there that you want to eat. Um, all the dog food is gone. Go to Home Depot. All the plywood is gone. And we are a just-in-time country, just-in-time economy. You blow up the supply chains like that, um, yeah, it's going to be something that what you are saying is not sensationalizing at all. It's real. I hate to be this guy, man. I do. I hate to be the buzzkill at the party. I don't talk about these things with my friends unless they bring it up to me because it's something no one wants to hear. I don't even like to say it. The sad part about it is that, you know, this country, the world was somewhat safe over all of these years because there was a mutual understanding that if you cross that line was something that technology would make it much easier for people who shouldn't have weapons or whatever it may be of mass destruction in their possession that, that won't follow by that same doctrine. So things are getting to the point where a false flag or a real event could very quickly precipitate that type of situation where the supply chains are just shut off. And if you're not prepared in any shape or form, you know, then what? And I hate saying this stuff, but I think it's realistic now. And there's a fine line between realism and pessimism. I I grant you that, but um, I have a hard time seeing the decisions that our administration are making and have anything other to believe that they're doing this purposely. And uh, they're trying to reset the system, find a villain and start over, start over in a way that um, allows them to enact their new agenda. Yeah, final thought here. Are foes really foes since you just made that point? Are foes really foes or does everybody need this reset? Because the Bank for International Settlements coming out earlier this year talking about their unified ledger, digitizing every possible and every single asset on the planet, assigning a value to it so then they can restart the debt-based economy based on just that. I mean, you and I are going to have to go to the same party because I'm Mr. Buzzkill talking about solar cycles that are going to really dent into global food production. But you need to get ready by having your community, learning how to garden, learning where your water supplies are, learning how to barter and trade with others, how to share tasks so you can produce more food in a community setting because more hands you are going to produce more. So I guess, we, you know, we'd be sitting at the dinner table by ourselves talking and other people around the periphery be like, what are they talking? Are they speaking English? But really, as a foe of foe, I guess that's my last thought for you. Everybody Uh, needs to reset. They really do. And then the BIS coming out with this whole unified ledger. It's a little too quirky on the timing to reset after a full collapse around the world. Maybe that's just... uh, You mean the IMF, not the BIS, right? 
So no, the Bank for International Settlements, they come out as so a unified, unified ledger, ledger, quote unquote. Okay. Right. So look, well, the IMF came out at the beginning of the year and they said um, uh, they issued a report saying gold as a uh, international reserve, comma, a barbarous relic no more. And they are acknowledging gold's role as a pivotal point uh, um, anchor in a, in a monetary system. They just uh, Kristalina Georgieva just came out and said any any central bank digital currency not pegged to something is fiat is a foe a foe look there are a lot of people who i talk to who believe that that trump is involved with xi jinping and putin and this is being orchestrated to show the hand of of the democrats or the left who are destroying themselves uh there are people who believe that maybe they're not a foe i happen to think that um a lot of the foes are foes to be honest with you. And I think that this is a, a a chance for a lot of these countries to find safety in numbers and stand up against century old Western dominance. Um, and I don't know who the foes are that you speak of, but I will simply say that this is being orchestrated from levels far higher than certainly President Biden even has the ability to comprehend. And I don't know who the foes are and who the friends are, who the white hats are and who the black hats are. You can ask different people and they'll have different ideas, but whatever it is, whoever is doing it, the the act of resetting the system will be one that will be a religious experience for most people. It will be something that most people are not prepared for. And whatever the motivations are, good or bad, in order to get to that point, you must go through an awful lot of pain. And that is that everything that has made people feel wealthy for a very long time are inversely correlated to interest rates going to the moon. When I see a guy like uh, Rick Santelli, I smoked a cigarette with Rick once on the Chicago Board of Trade. I smoked a cigarette. I'm not a cig smoker. I smoked it just to talk to him. He smoked six in the time I smoked one. I'm not kidding. He's a crazy little guy. He stands on a milk crate when he's on the Board of Trade uh, on CNBC. And, and when he's coming out, this is a guy that is very moderate. He's not on Fox. He's not on on um, alternative media. He's on CNBC. He says his charts see 10-year rates going to almost 14%. Well, that's in and of itself. You throw in the loss of the petrodollar and you're talking massively double-digit interest rates that collapses everything. Now, I don't care what the motivations are, good or bad, friend or foe. The ramifications to most people who have worked their whole life to get somewhere and, and feel accomplished will be the Klaus Schwab moment. I thought he was an idiot when he said it. You'll own nothing and be happy. But think about rates going to 30%, God forbid. I mean, in, in the span of a year and a half, the cost of money on, the, on a 30-year mortgage is up 87%. A $400,000 home at 2.85% is, is $1,600 a month. At 8.25% is $3,000 a month. So what happens if they, if, if they jump double or triple? What happens to the real estate market, to the bond market? to the ability of corporations to borrow money, to everything, to equities. The whole thing implodes. And I think that is in our future. There is your reset. And I don't care what the motivations are, who's good or who's bad. It's going to be a very difficult experience for this country. But maybe that's the whole idea. Level everyone to the same playing field and start over. Because with $150 trillion or whatever the number is in debt, there ain't a chance in hell we'll pay it off. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. I guess my final thought is this. When Janet Yellen came out and said, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default. They've added $2 trillion or more since that moment. It took us over 210 years to do the first trillion and a half. We did it in, in just a few short months. But what she should have said is, because what she admitted is we're a Ponzi scheme. What was Bernie Madoff? Keep money coming in the door so I can pay everyone else out so they don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. Money stopped coming in, he goes to prison. Well, what she should have said was, because that's exactly what the U.S. government is, we're borrowing money to pay the interest on the money we already borrowed. So what she should have said is, it's time for the U.S. to, to put on its big boy and big girl pants. It's time for us to raise the minimum retirement age to 75. It's time for us to close the majority of our military bases around the world and bring everyone home. It's time for us to cut entitlements. It's time for us to stop giving money away to the world. It's time for us to take care of us. You know, uh, the, the 150 billion we gave to the Ukraine, which we borrowed every penny to do so, 
what would that have done to the infrastructure of this country, to the roads, the bridges, the border, everything? Say what you want about Israel. We had a, we made them a promise. They were our ally in the Middle East, and we, we we stand by our promises. We didn't have that promise with the Ukraine. And that money that we've given, we didn't have. We, we're borrowing. We are broke. We are insolvent. This will not lead to a good outcome. And um, I think it's foregone. I do. I really, I truly do. So I think what you need to do is start preparing. And instead of um, lamenting where we are, I guess you just, you accept it for what it is and do the best you can. Pay yourself first, get some food, get some water, get out of debt, build a community, own a gun and some bullets, own some metals. Um, Cause I, other than that, I, I don't know what to do because I do believe this is actually what they have to do in order to get out of the quagmire they're in. Remember a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. These numbers are too big to ever be paid off. So typically you have two options. One is inflate. Two is default, three is find a villain, and that is what they will choose, and um, and that's how they start over. And hopefully that bail-in does not include your property, as I've seen some banks saying that they could drop you all assets and property. So I have the name of the report for you. I looked it up while you're speaking. It's called the Blueprint for Future Money System, or Future Monetary System, excuse me. Blueprint for the Future Monetary System, Improving the Old, Enabling the New. And they go through on how they are going to digitize all assets and they are going to actually put a usage clause inside each asset on what you can or cannot do with that asset. Like David's farm here, he's not allowed to have any cattle. If he does, that nullifies his ownership of it. It reverts back to the state and I'll probably have to pay a $50,000 fine of the new money, whatever that form that takes. But uh, I've been talking with Andy Schechtman here, CEO of Miles Franklin hope you got something out of this because look at what he and I both said. You need to get ready for your own food production or supplement what you can possibly get off supply chain. You need to have that community ready and you need to be ready to pivot yourself on a dime in the changes that we're about to see because you might have this great plan, but as soon as something new comes, you're going to have to pivot. So I think embracing change and being able to operate in a constantly changing environment is going to be a real asset and a skill to acquire. But aside from the money, we both came at that. We need to grow food. That's going to be a really important one. So you're not relying on systems. Because you imagine if they're going to make you jump through hoop A, B, C, D to get into a supermarket. We saw that the last three years. What if they amp it up this time even further? Like, oh, you're going to have to sign a military draft card before we allow you to get your rationing app, which will be digitized on all the blockchain this time for sure. You won't have your little coupon ration books from the 40s to go get your two gallons of gas per week. It'll be digitized. So anyway, yeah, that's my final. If, but uh, yeah, if you're not vaccinated or you have, you're not, you know, it'll be programmed into your ability to use it. Nomi Prince put something out. It was fantastic, showing the patents that Bill Gates has related to this new system, the reverse ATMs that take money and give you credit card back. All of these things. But um, the one of the things she talked about is that a leaked memo that she got through the Freedom of Information Act, where the IRS comes out and says. These are the things that you could do to this. The technology allows you to program it, to prohibit, to block, to um, to shut off. So you didn't, you know, you didn't get your vaccine. What are you doing out buying gas? We're calling the authorities. Your money is shut off. Go home now. The police will meet you there. I mean, that's very 1984 dystopian. But how far off is it when you talk about this stuff? And very scary, no question about it. But yeah, hope for the very best. Prepare the best you can. David, I, I, the questions you've asked are some of the best I've had in a long time. I would be honored at any time to come back um, if you'd have me. And uh, please feel free. I'm a text or a phone call away. You won't have to ask twice. I really enjoyed this. And uh, I would look forward to picking up where we left off, given the opportunity. Yeah, thanks. Because I'd really like to pick off with the BIS with the uh, programmable tokens on all assets and how we're going to have to try to transverse that environment as well. You know, so definitely I'll take you up on that. And uh, bye for now for everybody else out there and look for our next talk whenever that might come about.